I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. Paul here is describing his second visit to Jerusalem and he says it's in response to a revelation he does not give the details of that revelation uh, Bible scholars say that this visit to Jerusalem probably refers to the trip that he and Barnabas made in Acts chapter 11 now for the last couple of weeks we've seen that the book of Galatians is very much a gospel-centered book. Paul writes to the Galatians in response to them veering off the path of the true gospel. And the gospel remains the very focal point of his letter, even as we look at chapter 2. He makes it clear to the Galatians that he was faithful to this gospel in verse 2 he says I presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles verse 5 so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you verse 7 on the contrary they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised this was a man that was faithful to this message of the gospel. Now, how do we see him demonstrating this faithfulness to the gospel as he gives this account to the Galatians? Let's look at this question under four headings. Firstly, he demonstrates faithfulness to the gospel by preaching an unchanging gospel. Secondly, by defending the gospel. Thirdly, by being recognized as a messenger of the gospel. And fourthly, by being eager to help the poor. Let's begin with preaching an unchanging gospel. Paul makes it clear that after many years, he is still committed to the same gospel message. Verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem. This time with Barnabas, I took Titus along also. Time had passed. 14 years had passed since Paul had come to faith in Jesus and started to preach the gospel. Those who have looked at this verse carefully, they, they suggest that this 14 years refers to 
the time since Paul became a Christian. I've been reflecting on being a Christian recently because this year is 20 years since I said yes to Jesus Christ. In March, it's 20 years since I surrendered my life to Christ, said, Christ, I, I choose to follow you with everything that I am. I surrender every aspect of my life to your Lordship. And, and Paul is, is looking back and saying, it's, it's been some time I've been following Jesus. And I went up to Jerusalem. He goes up to Jerusalem as part of a team. He mentions Barnabas, who was well known to the church in Jerusalem. He mentions Titus, who was his son in the faith. Now, while in Jerusalem, he was able to meet privately with the leaders of the church there. He was able to meet with the other apostles. Verse 2, meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. Paul presented the same gospel that he preaches among the Gentiles. This is what I preach. I'm not bringing to you something different, something watered down, something that I have come up with. This is the same gospel all these years I'm presenting to you now. This is what I preach among the Gentiles. It was not the gospel that he used to preach. But now because of persecution, he's decided to start preaching a different gospel. He and Barnabas had been expelled from Pisidian Antioch. That's a part of this region of Galatia. We see that in Acts 13. He had been stoned and left for dead in Lystra, also a part of Galatia. You'd think after those kind of experiences, he would be tweaking that gospel a bit. If that's the kind of trouble you get in for this message of the gospel, maybe I need to start adjusting it, watering it down a bit, making it a little bit more attractive, making it less offensive. No, he says, I preached the same gospel. This is the gospel. He didn't start preaching a prosperity gospel so that he could get rich, so that he could give people promises of wealth and how they can do better financially and materially. He didn't start doing that. He continued to preach that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. He continued to say to wherever he went, listen, you are a sinner. You fall short of the glory of God, the standard of God's holiness, of his perfect nature which you had at some stage, but after our first parents decided to disobey, decided to exercise their free will, Adam and Eve, and they went off their own way, we now all fall short. And we stand under the judgment of God. And whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, you need a savior. You need to repent of your sin. You need to receive Jesus Christ who came as a substitute, lived a sinless, perfect life, went to the cross in your place, died for you, and took the punishment that was meant for you. He continued to preach that gospel even when it meant his own life was in jeopardy. He didn't water it down. He didn't start to, how do I get in more people to follow me by saying something a little bit easier to swallow. Same gospel. Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day. And if you put your faith in him, you can have eternal life. Because God is not only just, he's also merciful and gracious. In verse 2, he says, I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Now some have suggested that Paul presented his message to the leaders in Jerusalem because he wanted to be sure that he wasn't preaching 
the wrong message. He wanted to make sure that he wasn't running in vain means that, am I really preaching the correct gospel message? But it's difficult to accept that view. Why would Paul think he was preaching the wrong message if he knew that the message he received came directly from Jesus Christ himself, as we saw two weeks ago? Why would Paul think he was preaching the wrong message if he was so sure of his calling to be a preacher of the gospel, something that he states from the very first line of this letter to the Galatians? And, and after he presented his gospel to them, he says, well, they actually added nothing to my message, confirming that he was preaching the true gospel. So something else, not the truthfulness of his message, was of concern to him. The concern about running in vain had more to do with his relationship with the other leaders than about the validity of his message. Because our race in the gospel is not a competition against each other. I'm not running my race against you. I'm running my, my race with you. We're not running our race against other churches that are preaching the gospel. We're supposed to be running our race with those other churches that are preaching the true gospel. So running our race is not, I'm trying to beat everyone else. It's like, hey, let's get as far as we can together because we can do more together than we can apart. So to run in vain means to run in isolation, to run without the support of others. And Samuel Ngewa, uh, I've been introduced to him by, by my friend Mark Dunker, um, who recently gave me a a commentary on Galatians written uh, by an African scholar, which is fantastic. Samuel Ngewa, who's a professor of New Testament studies at the Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of, of Theology, he says this, Paul uses a sports metaphor when he describes what he does as running my race, but we should not interpret this metaphor as implying that he was in competition with the believers in Jerusalem. They were all in the race together like runners in a relay. He would have been running in vain if they misunderstood what he was doing and hampered his work or tried to trip him up. Paul was not going to compromise the gospel. He was not going to preach a different gospel. He was not going to live a different gospel, yet he was keen for unity in this one gospel. To be faithful to the gospel, we should all be committed to the same unchanging gospel as Paul was. Secondly, we see Paul demonstrating faithfulness to the gospel by defending the gospel. Verses 3 to 5, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Now, circumcision was the sign of the covenant between God and the Israelites in the Old Testament. It was something that began with Abraham, their father, who is also our father in the faith. Abraham meets with God. And they enter into this covenant, and the sign of that covenant is circumcision. Circumcision is restated as part of the law that was given through Moses. So we read in Leviticus 12, verse 1 to 3, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, 
A woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. This was the law that came through Moses. Now, there were false believers, as Paul calls them, who had come into that situation there in Jerusalem and they were beginning to say, listen, to really follow God, the Gentiles also need to be circumcised. They infiltrated the church like an enemy secretly coming into the camp to spy on the freedom that Paul and his associates had. And he, he, he singles out Titus because Titus was a Greek. And, and some have said Paul actually took Titus along just to test them, to see how are they going to treat this issue of the freedom that we have in Christ apart from the law. Freedom that comes by grace. Freedom that comes not because of things that man does, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. These false believers required that non-Jewish believers, Gentiles like Titus, should be circumcised. In other words, they needed to obey the law of Moses to really follow God, to really be righteous. Yes, it's Jesus, but you know, grace, no, grace is not enough. You need grace, but plus some other things. Grace plus the law. Gospel plus law, basically, is what they were saying. And this is what Paul means when he says they, they came to make us slaves because we have received freedom in Christ. What we need to do is, is to put our faith in Christ. We get a free gift of salvation. That's freedom. Now you're saying that's not enough. We need to also take on the law as well. That's slavery. Because the gospel that the Galatians had received was a message of grace. If we go back to chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I am astonished. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. To get salvation we do not have to observe the law. To get salvation, we do not have to do any works. Salvation is by grace. And these false believers, as, as he calls them, they were requiring, Titus, you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. But Paul says, we did not give in for a moment to that. In other words, we defended the gospel. Titus was saved by grace. Every Gentile who comes to Christ, every non-Jewish person, including you and I, who comes to Christ, comes to Christ by grace, not by any works of the law. Now, wonderfully, the leaders he met with were of the same view. Titus was not compelled by them to be circumcised because if anyone could put pressure, hey, Titus needs to be circumcised, it would have been those leaders, the apostles there in the church in Jerusalem. But they didn't. So Paul was not running his race in vain. He was on the same page with these other apostles regarding salvation by grace and not works. Circumcision was not required. In fact, in a later meeting called the Council of Jerusalem, which we read about in Acts 15, where the issue of whether circumcision was required for Gentiles to be saved, this issue was discussed there. This is what the apostle Peter had to say. He says, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. We Jews saved by grace. 
them Gentiles, non-Jews, saved by grace. Now, unfortunately, the purity of the gospel continues to be compromised even today by some Christians and some false Christians, if we use the language of Paul here. We have a gospel and then we add works to it. For example, we have those who will say, to be saved, you need to be baptized. So we take infants and we say, if we baptize those infants, the work of placing those infants in water, sprinkling them with water, somehow that imparts new spiritual life. No, it doesn't. That would make salvation something that comes through a work that we as people have to do. No, salvation is by grace. Or think about the issue of alcohol. To be a true Christian, you must abstain from alcohol. So the work of abstaining, not drinking even a drop of alcohol, that's what makes you a Christian. I was in a meeting recently and someone said, okay, let's freshen ourselves up. Let's all stand and refresh. And he says, okay, everybody, you know, right, left. Okay, now we all stand on one leg. And he said, everybody here should be able to stand on one leg because no one here drinks beer. Now, let's be careful on this. The Bible is clear that getting drunk is a sin. It says, don't get drunk, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. But to say that the Bible teaches that a true Christian will never touch a sip of alcohol, show me the scripture. I mean, why would Jesus turn water into wine as his first miracle? If he was totally against anyone taking even a drop of alcohol. Of course, some would say that was non-alcoholic wine. Again, show me the verse. But we have added certain rules, certain things, certain man-made requirements and said grace is not enough. We need to do certain things to really be Christians, to really be saved, to really be in right standing with God. And we empty the cross of its power in so doing. Jesus said it's finished on the cross. So Paul defends the gospel. He shows his faithfulness by defending the gospel. To be faithful to the gospel, we should also be ready to defend the true gospel. The outcome of Paul's faithfulness was to be recognized as a messenger of the gospel. The outcome of his faithfulness, preaching a consistent message, defending a consistent message is that he was recognized as a messenger of the gospel by those who were leaders in Jerusalem. In verse 6, as for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. There were leaders in Jerusalem that were better known than Paul. He goes on to mention James, who was the, the Lord's brother, Cephas, Peter, who was the leader of the 12 apostles, John, the disciple that Jesus loved. There were some heavyweights in this first church. These were men that had spent time with Jesus in person and they were held in high esteem they were much respected by the church Paul says the honor they received makes no difference to me he wasn't going to try and impress them he wasn't intimidated by them he wasn't going to adjust his message to get into their good books now why does he say this was Paul boasting Did he say this because actually deep down he thought, I'm the big shot here, not these guys. 
Did he say this because deep down he wanted the honor for himself, not to go to them? No. Here is his reason. He says, because God does not show favoritism. God could use him powerfully just as he could use these other men powerfully. God could use those who had lived up close and personal with Jesus and equally he could use him who had been a chief persecutor of Jesus. Verses 7 to 8, on the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. During the time that Paul spent with the leaders in Jerusalem, they saw that God had entrusted to him this work of preaching the message to the Gentiles. They saw clearly God is with this man. Recall that he had gone there to, to present the gospel to them. And after they heard his message, they were convinced they added nothing to it. They realized that only God could have given Paul this message that he was preaching. As Peter was called by God to be at the forefront of reaching the Jews, so Paul was called by God to be at the forefront of reaching the Gentiles. Now, while Paul's faithfulness was important in the recognition that he received, 14 years of standing for the gospel, even under very tough conditions, even under life-threatening conditions, something else even more important was a factor. We read in verse 9, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. What was at work in Paul was grace. And here is another reason to believe that, that he wasn't boasting. Because Paul says that as, as I looked at how things were unfolding, what I realized is ultimately these brothers in Christ were seeing the grace of God in me. The years of preaching by grace, that gospel message that he preached by grace, the call to the Gentiles by grace, the commitment to defend the gospel by grace. It was all by grace. And they extended the right hand of fellowship to him and Barnabas. This extension of this right hand of fellowship one author says that it carries the sense of, of an agreement that depends on the honor and integrity of, of both parties. When they extended the right hand of fellowship, it was in recognition of grace that God had given him. It was God who was at work in him. What did Paul say to the Corinthians when he's talking about the other apostles? He says to them, I am the least of the apostles. And you're like, that, that's a great statement. It's, it's so good to be humble. But then he goes on to say, and he says, hey, but I worked harder than all of them. Uh-oh, Paul, aren't you wandering into pride? You were doing really well when you said you were the least. Now you're saying you worked harder. But then he qualifies it by saying, but it wasn't I that was at work. It was the grace of God that was at work in me. He points it all Whatever he, he achieved, whatever he was able to do, the hard work, the progress, all of that he points to the grace of God. 
He, he's not taking any credit for it himself, really. I worked hard, yes, but actually it was the grace of God that was at work in me. So our salvation, we come to Christ by grace, but even what we do for Christ is by grace. So in verse 9 we read, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. That was the agreement based on the evidence of God's grace. So to be faithful to the gospel, we should not chase after recognition. We are not entitled to recognition. Whatever we achieve in serving God is by grace. We are not, offense will not be appointed an elder because he's been chasing after recognition. He's been saying, hey, have you seen me? Have you seen how much I, I do for God's tribe? Have you seen the gifts that God has given me that serve this church? That, that's, not, that's not the spirit of it. There's something about well, we've seen the grace of God in his life. And as he works hard and gives himself to the mission, and yes, he's got gifts that God can use, it's all by grace. Finally, we see Paul's faithfulness to the gospel in him being eager to help the poor. After they had agreed, you guys go to the Gentiles, we'll carry on with the Jews. They said this, guys, please go to the, please continue to remember the poor. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I had been eager to do all along. Now, Paul and Barnabas had already demonstrated a commitment to help the poor. In Acts chapter 11, we read that the church in Antioch, after a prophetic word from Agabus, God reveals through Agabus something that will happen in the future. Agabus stands up and he says, through the Holy Spirit I see famine coming. And the church responds by saying, we need to help our brothers and sisters in Judea. So they, they collect according to their ability and they get, at that stage it was Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas was kind of the primary guy in the relationship at the time. They get Barnabas and Saul, and they send them with this gift up to Jerusalem. And actually, the, the Bible scholars tell us that what we have read this morning happened on the back of them arriving in Jerusalem after coming with this gift from Antioch. So it would make sense that after they've spoken about circumcision and freedom that comes from grace and all these things that the leaders there would say, guys, oh, please continue to remember the poor. Because they had come with a gift for the poor. So Paul and Barnabas have this commitment that we already see to helping the poor. For Paul, bringing this gift was not a once-off affair. And it's interesting that it says they asked that we should continue to remember the poor. But then Paul makes it very personal. He says the very thing I had been eager to do all along. Doesn't mean that Barnabas wasn't eager or Titus wasn't eager. They probably were. But he's saying, listen guys, yes, thank you for calling us to to continue remembering the poor. But as for me, as for Paul, I am really eager to continue doing this. It's not a once-off thing. It's a commitment. As I'm committed to Christ and I look at the life that, that Christ lived and how he called us to, to visit those who are in prison, 
and to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry, as I look at that, I'm totally committed to this. Faithfulness to the gospel was seen in Paul's life not only through preaching, but also in providing for the physical needs of the poor. If we go earlier in the book of Acts to chapter 2 and chapter 4, we see that this, this church in Jerusalem sacrificially cared for the poor. We see them selling their possessions and distributing the money to the needy. Encouraging Paul and Barnabas to remember the poor was something they were fully committed to themselves. Are we as a church committed to helping the poor? Over the years, we have paid for the education of people who cannot pay for themselves. We've paid rent. We're still doing it for people that cannot pay rent for themselves. We've given money for basic needs. We've supported an orphanage. We've started work for a living, which helps people get jobs. Through our sister Catherine, we are involved with prisons, and it's great to see others getting behind that as well. And I think you'll agree with me that we can do even more. May God help us to be a church that is committed to the poor, to helping the poor among us. Because the gospel is good news to the poor. To be faithful to the gospel, let's have this commitment, not as a side thing, something we, we just do on the side or we just do to make us look good or feel good. No, it needs to be an integral part of our faith to remember the poor. So this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, I hope that as, we've have, as we have looked at the life of, of Paul, we will grow in our own faithfulness to the gospel. I thank you all for your faithfulness and where you are at in being faithful to the gospel, in being one who stands for the gospel and defends it and, and, and goes through challenges and trials and difficulties and continues to stand for that true gospel. I thank you for your commitment to one another. But I would say, even in my own life, there's room to become even more faithful to the gospel. May God help us to do that.